Hello and welcome to Globe Watch with me, Charles Ibunde, eight from the Brazilian residence here in Yaoundé, Cameroon. Next week, the first ever One Forest Summit opens in the Gabonese capital, Libreville. It will assemble world leaders under the auspices of President Ali Bongo Ondimba and French President Emmanuel Macron. This at a time when one of the stabilizers of our natural environment, the forest, is under heavy destruction. And the destruction constitutes roughly the 4 billion hectares of forest in the world, constituting roughly 30% of the global space. What are the crimes being committed to tropical forests in particular? And how do we maintain the natural ecosystem of our forests to ensure that normal life continues on planet Earth at a time when climate change is a major threat to human survival? My guest today on Globe Watch comes from Brazil. At one moment, he served in the National High Court of the country and is a graduate of Brazilian and American universities. He worked as a specialist on environmental issues for UN Secretary General and equally spent some time as a consultant with the United Nations Environment Program, plus the Global Judicial Environment Institute and other consumer-related elements of human survival in Brazil, in Europe, in Africa, and in other parts of the world. What are the key insights we can get from one of the world's leading environmental law specialists? <music> Professor Antonio Herman Benjamin. Welcome to Globe Watch. Thank you so much. You have an environmental lifestyle and experience of plus 24 years in activity. Why are you so interested in environmental protection? Well, the question should be why uh, um, everybody should not be interested on the protection of the environment. Because the environment affects all of us. We cannot exist if we don't protect the environment. And I'm talking about air, water, um, soil. Um, we want to, um, uh, to protect our lives, but also uh, the community of life uh, as a whole. We depend on this community of life. So I personally am very interested in, on, on the environment, but uh, it's important that everybody understands uh, that the environment affects everyone. So everyone should um, be concerned with the protection of the environment. Tell me the situation of environmental protection in Latin America in particular, and in Brazil precisely, where you were born, and you have a huge uh, experience. And of course, Brazil is one of the key players in one of the world's largest natural forest ecosystem, the Amazon. The situation of forests around the world, not just in Brazil, and especially tropical forest, is a complex one. Uh, forests are being destroyed uh, in a massive manner, and we have to uh, understand that without forests, we cannot have water. Uh, for example, Cameroon and Brazil depends a lot for electricity generation on hydropower. Hydropower depends on forest. If the forest disappear, the water uh, uh, quantity will, will suffer. And of course, the energy generation will suffer as well. The situation of the Amazon rainforest is a very delicate one. First of all, it's true that Brazil holds over 50% of the forest, is the largest um, uh, um, continuous track of forest in the world. That uh, part of Brazil that is the Amazon rainforest is bigger than Europe, uh, but it has suffered a lot in terms of deforestation uh, and it's still suffering. So the hope is that we can, uh, in the past, uh, I would say 10 years, 
uh, stop the, the illegal deforestation. I'm talking about the illegal deforestation in the Amazon, and and then restore what has been destroyed, uh, because the the forest itself affects the whole country. You are core martyr as a legal dawn is particularly in environmental protection. You worked under the Secretary General of the United Nations. You worked with the United Nations Environment Program, which is the gendarme of the United Nations when it comes to environmental protection and in ensuring that we live in a safer natural ecosystem, just like other campaign groups, including WWF, that is the World Wide Fund for Nature. When you sit at the highest policy level and you see all the material which is in front of you, what do you think is the key problem in ensuring a safer natural environment today? First of all, we need to have uh, laws, good laws, not just any law. Second, we need to have implementation of those laws, not just any implementation, but good implementation of those laws. And third, we need to have uh, society educated about the importance of the environment. As I said, we depend on the environment for everything in our life, from water to the air that we breathe, everything. We take care of our houses, we clean our houses, we make sure that we repair our houses and don't let other people destroy our houses. This same rationale should apply to the environment. We cannot survive in an environment that is damaged, is deteriorated, is polluted, forests uh, are cleared. The World Commission on Environmental Law of the um, International Union for the Conservation of Nature, IUCN, has developed this initiative that is called a Model Forest Act, in uh, uh, cadre for the environment. Uh, the basic idea is that often those forests, and I'm talking especially about tropical forests, are shared by several countries. And you have a legal regime on one side of the border, another legal regime on the other side of the border. It's not that they should be the same, but at least they should be coherent. Otherwise, you protect the forest on one side, and it's entirely unprotected on the other side. So the World Commission on Environmental Law and the Global Judicial Institute, Institute on the Environment is developing this, it's a 10-year project in which we will draft with scientists, law experts, economists, and so on, and philosophers. We will develop a model act that countries will, can just borrow when they are either enacting a new forest act or reforming the present forest legislation. The, the, the institutions you just mentioned are institutions where you have worked with and there are others and the list can go on. Um, I saw you in 2022 at the Texas University delivering a lecture on some of the issues that you were just talking about and the topic was can laws save the forest. When you look at the avatar, at the avalanche, at the current legal system in which we operate, do you think that the Congo Basin, for example, or the Amazon can rely on those laws for their natural ecosystems to be maintained? We have three main areas of tropical forest in the world. The Amazon, the largest, the Congo Basin, the second, and the third is in Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, but includes India uh, and so on. If we want to protect tropical forests in the world, we have to have those three major regions of the world working to together. It's not an easy task. But it's not, at the same time, enough to protect the Amazon. We need to protect tropical forests around the world. 
In the case of the Congo Basin, the challenge are enormous. They are enormous in the Amazon too, or Indone in Indonesia. Cameroon is the headquarters of COMIFAC, which is the Central African Forest Commission. Commission. And that's the main reason why I'm here. The goal is to integrate COMIFAC and the Congo Basin, the countries of the Congo Basin, in, in this initiative of uh, the drafting process of a Model Forest Act. Mm. Uh, it, it will not save the forest per se, but it's very important because without clear laws and laws that are well drafted, we cannot begin our homework of protecting the forest. It's not enough, but it is the starting point. One of the key stakes of protecting the natural environment and forests in particular is to substantially ensure that the less than 1.5 degrees Celsius is maintained in order to keep the avalanche of climate change at bay, as agreed at the Paris climate change deal. When you look at the way uh, the policy makers, the politicians behave, do you think that the issues you are raising uh, 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 will be sustained? As a judge, I cannot make any statement, I should not make any statement about the politicians. I'm asking uh, yeah, the question. I know, I know. I'm asking the question to a university don. I will come yeah. back to your life as a judge in a moment. Yeah. <laughs> but as a judge, as I said, um, I cannot make and I should not make any statement about uh, politicians. What it is important to state is that we need good laws and in order to get good laws, we need to have good legislators. And legislators that are fully informed and have the instruments available for them to draft those good laws. So that's our goal. It's with this Model Forest Act is to facilitate the work of the legislators. They will, oh, well, I need to draft my my new forest code or reform the existing forest code, let me check the Model Forest Act uh, and see what I can benefit and then adjust to the reality of my, my own country. It, laws don't come from Mars. Laws are enacted either by Parliament or by the executive branch regulations and for both we need to have good science behind them and we need to have good legal technique to draft those laws. The worst nightmare for those that want to protect the environment is to have laws that are chaotic. This is bad for the judges that we at the end of the day decide the case it's bad for the government that, that doesn't know what to do with two laws or three laws that say different things, contradict each other. It's terrible for the private sector, those that want to comply with the law, but which law am I going to comply? One of the initiatives to uh, define more of the content of what you were just talking about is, of course, the first ever one for its summit to hold in the Gabonese capital Libreville next week. When you see at the arsenal of the invitees by pre French President Emmanuel Macron and President Ali Bongo of Gabon who are co-hosting with a virtual participation recorded of King Charles III, do you think that we are heading towards the right direction in providing safety nets for our forest. Those meetings are important because they highlight the problem. People, the, even those that don't follow what's happening in the environmental uh, arena, are informed. Oh, see, you have all those presidents and kings and prime ministers getting together. This has to be important. 
it highlights an issue. And I think that's one of the purpose of, um, of the meeting in, in Gabon. The second purpose is to stress that the protection of the, the Congo Basin rainforest is a multi-country effort. It's not one single country. Uh, Cameroon has a, a large part of it, Congo, Gabon, all those uh, countries that are involved in the, Congo, in the Congo Basin. The third is a dialogue between North and South. Uh, the fact that we have uh, presidents and even kings from uh, Europe and the developed world indicates that this is an issue that interests the whole world, not just something lost in, in the middle of nowhere in the Amazon or in the, in the Congo Basin. I stated at the start of our conversation that you are a member of the Superior uh, Court in Brazil, a kind of specialized Supreme Court, and some of the issues you were handling over a plus 10-year career had to do with the environment. Personally, as a judge, which are some of the landmark judgments you passed or you witnessed in Brazil in particular when it comes to environmental protection? My court, the National High Court of Brazil, Superior Tribunal de Justiça, is a combination of the French Coup de Cassation and Conseil d'État, mm. both together. Yeah. And we uh, deal with a large number of environments. And the decisions you take, they are final because they don't go to any other... Well, unless there is a constitutional issue, and then it goes to the, to, to, uh, to the constitutional court. Mm. We deal with a lot of environmental cases uh, per year, from deforestation to water contamination, air contamination, noise pollution, wildlife trafficking, pesticide contamination, you name it. What is important in, in those cases is the fact that we see the legal system working. If you want to see whether an environmental legal system of a particular country is serious or not, check the precedents, the case law at the Supreme Court. If there is no precedent, it means that the legal system for the protection of the environment is dormant. It's not been implemented or it's not been litigated in the courts. In the case of Brazil, in spite of all the difficulties that we have and massive deforestation of the Amazon, particularly in the, in, in the past four years, we see this, the legal system and the courts working and delivering hundreds, thousands of decisions per year in those areas. It's not perfect, it's quite imperfect. However, if we compare this with other countries, I, am, I think it's fair to say that Brazil has one of the most active judicial system. One of the features of your work is the protection of the consumer. When you look at people in communities around the world, it can be in the DRC, it can be in the Amazon, it can be in Bolivia, it can be in the United States of America, who largely depend on the natural ecosystem for their survival, such as the cutting of trees, hunting, uh, fishing, and whatsoever, and all the pollution you were talking about. How much of the legal system and political will is injected in protection of the consumer? Something that you are so familiar with. The other area that I work with is consumer law. La, uh, droit de la consommation. And here, 30 years ago, the environmental law and consumer law were entirely separated. So when I started working with consumer law in the early 80s, we had no dialogue with environmental law. In those years, things changed dramatically because now we have a concept that's called sustainable consumption, 
which uh, in a nutshell means that consumers are part of the environmental dialogue either because they are the end of the road for products and service they have decision-making power whatever consumers decide might or orient or reorient uh, the market from a health perspective uh, consumers uh, are we cannot separate consumers uh, uh, based on where they live in the world somebody that li lives in Cameroon or in Brazil or in the United States their health the value of their health should be exactly the same. What happens to those who broke the law or who by accident in their activities are found or caught in the violation of the laws that exist? Here is the case. You have a tanker from British Petroleum, BP or Shell, which uh, has its oil, maybe because of an attack, leaked and pollute the water or you have a plane crash and nobody wishes that but they all happen all the time and destroys part of the forest maybe protected areas how do you handle all those issues well in the in the uh, technical legal jargon uh, the standard that we use is called strict liability for environmental damage it means that in cases like the ones you mentioned, an oil spill, an accident, we are not going to ask whether the company acted negligently. The company is responsible strictly. It has to pay. If it caused the damage, it has to pay for the damage. I'm asking this, this question because this is what is mostly happening in Nigeria and the Nigerian local communities, especially Igunwa and all others, are always at loggerheads with oil giants on issues like this. Well, what Shell and other companies in Nigeria claim is that they didn't cause the damage, that the damage was caused by um, the communities that were um, Stealing, attacking their, it, stealing and attacking their oil installations. Yes. So Broken it, the pipes and whatsoever. Yes. So it's... Uh, 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 they are claiming... In other words, oil vandalism. They are claiming that the damage, the causation of the damage is not with them, but with other people. In fact, the victims uh, themselves. What your question, your first question addressed was about negligence. Uh, or non-negligence. The standard is non-negligent negligence. You, we don't ask whether the company was negligent or not, but okay. you still have to prove causation okay. that the, that that the damage is linked to the activity of uh, the defendant. You created an institute to serve as a kind of personal legacy if you go on retirement or you are not around how does that impact on environmental protection or if you like in the natural ecosystem i have been working with two organizations uh, in the area of environmental law uh, the first is uh, the iucn world commission on environmental law i was president of that commission for nine years and in 2016 uh, judges from around the world, from Supreme Court, senior judges, established the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment, which is uh, registered in, in Switzerland, and it is uh, based or has its secretariat in Nairobi with uh, the United Nations Environment uh, Program. Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, Kenya. Uh, those two organizations, uh, together with the third one, which is in fact the oldest uh, international uh, organization dealing with environmental law. It's called the International Council of Environmental Law. The three organizations lead the world in the area of the development of environmental law. 
from legal theory, the law professors, all the way to, to law implementation, the judges, the public prosecutors, uh, the public interest lawyers, uh, training programs, publications. Our role is on the academic side and at the same time at uh, ground level, so, um, so to speak, uh, uh, doing capacity building for people that can uh, play an important role in uh, law development and drafting and law implementation. There are concessions which were made for zones like the Amazon, like the Congo Basin, to maintain their natural ecosystem, precisely at the Paris Climate Change Deal of 2015, where they agreed providing roughly, and if my statistics are correct, $100 billion yearly to developing countries to ensure that their own development targets to ensure industries, uh, globalization, do not destroy our natural environment like the British, the French, the Americans and Japanese or the European Union countries, like the trajectory they took in developing. Why do you think that up to 2023, we are still complaining that the cash is not coming in? Even the one found at the Global Green Fund is largely insufficient. Where is the problem? It's difficult to understand why uh, countries understand the seriousness of a problem, in this case climate change crisis and the biodiversity crisis and the pollution crisis. Second, countries that have the resources uh, and third, countries that having the resources and having the knowledge about the seriousness of the problem do not allocate the funds that are necessary. Look, in the case of uh, the conflict, uh, the war between Russia and Ukraine, in, in one year, the, the European and countries and the United States it spent over $100 billion on weapons. And it, why it's so difficult to come up with $1 billion, $2 billion, even $10 billion for the protection of biodiversity and the protection of the climate system. So the money is there. Uh, what is lacking really is the political will. If you were to provide one single advice to governments, institutions, non-governmental organizations and other actors of the environmental protection movement, what would that be from the altar as a university done? Be it in Illinois, United States, where you graduated, or at Texas, or at the University of Sao Paulo, or even here in Yaoundé, Cameroon, where you are found? I believe that the most relevant thing to consider is that there are some types of environmental damage that are irreversible. If you pollute the air by smokestacks, cement plant, that is reversible. If you pollute the rivers that cross Yonde or Sao Paulo, uh, at some point you, uh, you have good uh, treatment, that's reversible. But there are two types of damage, at least, you could mention other ones, that are absolutely irreversible. It's damage to the climate system, if we pass beyond this no turning um, back point. Of two degrees Celsius. I don't know if it's just two degree. I'm saying uh, if we have transformed the climate system of the world in a manner, doesn't matter if it's two degree, half degree, one degree, but we transform to a point where no um, technology is available to restore 
then we are in a terrible situation. And with that, we conclude the interview. Um, Brazilian environmental specialist, George University Don, UN consultant and environmental protection expert, Professor Antonio Herman Benjamin. Thank you very much indeed for being guest on the Thank you so much. You're welcome. My pleasure.